Welcome to the Jamoti Podcast. We are all surrounded by amazing coaches and leaders. So let's get an inside look at not just what they do, but how they do what they do. After all, becoming the best versions of ourselves is Jamoti, just a matter of doing it. The Jamoti Podcast is powered by Sideline Interactive. Sideline Interactive is the leading manufacturer for high quality, innovative scoring tables and LED video display boards that help coaches and schools bring more excitement to fans, create huge fundraising opportunities, and make their jobs easier. Visit sidelineinteractive.com to check out their amazing products. Shaka Smart asked a great question at TBC Clinic again. And for yeah. those coaches that don't know, because I've been, been using that term, Texas Association of Basketball Coaches in the state of Texas, it's kind of our biggest you know coaches yeah. group that we have. And for those listeners and that don't know what that is, but I was listening to him at a TABC, and he asked that question. He says, does our relationship depend on your playing time? And I, I thought that was a really unique way to put it back on the player's to make sure that they're viewing our relationship the correct way. Yeah. But yeah. then the opposite should be true is does our relationship depend on how good you are or how well you're performing yeah. as a play? Cause it can't be that way for us, to, us to them either. You know, what's crazy about that. Um, <clears throat> I had some really good teams, particularly at Manhattan college. We would beat somebody by 25 points on a given night. And I'd be driving my 22 minute drive home. I wasn't, I was always thinking about the 10th, 11th and 12th man and saying, should I got him more playing time tonight? Mm. You know, that used to hurt me when I would think back, I, I would be, I would be hurt by the fact that we won big and everybody got to play, but could I have played that 10th man more? You know, so that I was always aware of that, you know, and again, it's not easy. You're when you're a leader in, a, in charge of 15 or 13 young guys and they all want to play and their parents all think they should be starting. And I lived it as a parent, too, by the way. Um, so I def, I absolutely think that you got to have that again, self-awareness to understand that you got to treat everybody fairly, as we say, differently depending on who they are, you know, as far as their, their playing time or whatever, but fairly enough to be able to explain, like, I really appreciate what you're doing for us. Like, I know you want to play more. Yeah. And in certain cases you're not playing because it's not that you're not good enough. We just have these guys that are playing great. They're older than you or whatever, you know, but I get it. Like you have to explain that. And they're not going to always be happy with your answers, but it'll be in their head yes. that you took the time to, articulate that i think just taking the time to yeah. acknowledge it your yeah. to your to your point in the moment they're like oh coach you know what that's good i'm great now no like yeah that's not gonna yeah. happen but when they go home when they yeah. have that conversation with their parents you yeah. are depositing into their account when it yeah. seems like all we do is withdraw yeah you hope so you really hope so and, and again it's not perfect it's not because <clears throat> there's so many external um uh, things yep. out there parents friends how come you're not playing and i just think honesty is a you know i one of the hardest things about you I, I i say young coaches because i was a young coach right and 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 i think this podcast can really help people just getting started matt which is why i love being on today and i you finally got me we always tried to figure out when <laughs> to do this coach you're the but, big fish I, i've been fishing uh, for the big fish for two years i finally no it's it's no, man, it, not, it, it's but, hard with it's hard with schedules yeah yeah travel and everything but yeah you know like it's one of the hardest things to do as a young coach is tell the truth tell a player what he doesn't want to hear because we want we don't want them to be upset with us you yeah. know what i mean they they we want them to be happy and think that we're great and and that's just not the way life works and so but I think it gets back to like I I I love I love my time spending time with guys off the court road trips. I, I'll tell you a funny story. When you're as intense as I was, and you saw me practice at practice, you would think this guy's a dictator. You know he he you know like he uh, he controls everything. You know he's a madman. Whatever. I was I was maniacal about the few things that were important to me. But there were so many things like, for example, do you remember Deaf Comedy Jam on HBO with wow. the black yes. yeah. comedians, right? Uh, yeah. Russell Simmons and, you know, Bernie Mac and those guys, right? We had a road. We used to watch like Remember the Titans and, you know, Hoosiers, <laughs> right? We'd have a three-hour road trip to Baltimore. And so 
we'd put the movie on and we'd stop it out back or whatever, right? Yeah. You know how road trips are, right? And so one day, randomly, before we were leaving on a bus trip, one of the guys comes in and said, Coach, would you mind, can we put, we taped three hours of Deaf Comedy Jam. Could we watch that instead of a movie? I, what do I care, right? <laughs> I mean, that's not important to me. As long as there's no curse words and, you know, you know what I'm saying, if it wasn't yeah. over the top. Uh, right. We're not going to watch a, a a pornographic movie or something crazy. But I said, sure. So we put there three hours of Deaf Comedy Jam. We were rolling in the aisles for three hours. I mean, everybody, <laughs> coaches, managers, players, guys were screaming, laughing. Like it was unbelievable. I was screaming, laughing. I mean, the stuff was so funny. And the point was, and then they would say to me, coach, hey, we always stop at Outback on the way to this trip. Can we go to Applebee's? Yeah. What do I care? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. So I, I used to allow my team to make as many decisions that they could make that didn't affect the big picture. And like, I'll give you another example on the court. Okay. If we see a certain inbounds play during the course of a college season, by, by the middle of the season, we could guard it two or three ways. We could stay, we could switch, or we could pre-switch, like maybe out from the inbounder, right? There's a like a guy like Matt Saman coming out to the corner who could shoot it. Go guard so, that guy. <laughs> like <laughs> so I would say to the guys, we've guarded this three different ways this season. How do you want to guard this? Hmm. Okay, we're going to guard it. Whatever way we choose to guard it, we'll we'll guard it. They're not going to get a shot. But we could guard it. We could switch or stay. What do you, and I'd say, what do you think, Matt? And you'd look at your teammates and go, you guys want to switch this? And, yeah, let's switch it. All right, coach, we'll switch this. And i say, okay, here's what we're going to do. Remember, we, we saw this against Fairfield. He's going to go here. Here's the screen. Matt, you're switching out. Everybody good with that? So I allowed you to make the decision. I could have made it. But I know either either way we guard is going to work if we're fundamentally sound. So even in basketball practice or in game situations, I would say to the guys, how do you want to defend this? Or what do you want to do here? You know, what do you guys think? You know, and then you got you give them like that ownership of the team. That's why yep. that's why when I kicked them out that day to give them a day off, they didn't know that until 25 years later, basically. But they 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 took on they they had ownership of their team, and I didn't realize they had ownership. They knew why they were twenty-two and two because of what we did in practice. I think you're just you're nailing so many parts of just the art of coaching. It's just way more than the offense that you choose to run or the the the, the stats that you keep or the analytics that you that you go over with the guys and and I love that idea of giving them that because they're stakeholders. Yes. In your program. And so many times yeah. we don't view, I don't feel like we view players as that. It's like, we're up here. We make all the decisions. And you just do it. And and have, have kids changed in a lot of ways from when I played or even before? I don't, I don't, th I don't think so. But in one big yeah. way is the why and ownership. They've got their phones there. They've yeah. been, They've been raised differently. There's less like of this kind of military esque background with parents and do this and do that just because I tell you. So when you give them the ability to make those choices, I love what you said of things that don't matter to you that much. Like right. like in another point, coach is like not everything can matter to us the same amount. Right. The way we execute late in the game, man, that better matter to us. Yes. What yes. shoes they wear what place they go eat, what we watch. Coach, I made our teams watch Rocky Four 18 times. Like, yeah. I never yeah. once asked them for their opinion. But yeah. what are the things, if you got those guys together, that they probably talk about and, and laugh about and remember the most is you letting them watch that on the oh, on yeah. the trip, you know? No question, man. We, we have so many stories, and you do too, of – things that happen away from the court that you look back and go, man, that was so fun. That was so cool. That was so organic. You remember when coach Fran, uh, I, I, I give you a great example. I, we're out at Notre Dame one year when I'm at Manhattan college, we beat Notre Dame out there. And uh, I kicked my, I had my, I had a pair of loafers on and I used to kick the floor with the shoe. And I, when a, when a, you know, a player turned it over I, and I, we, we were, we won the game. So it was funny. But my shoe, my shoe went 10 rows into the stands. 
it, I kicked, I went to kick and I missed and it, the shoe, my a loafer flew off my foot and flew into the stands. Right. And so that's a story that these guys still tell, you know? Yeah. And th- those kind of things. And I think the other thing too is, you know, you have to be in charge. You do have to be in charge. You do have to have a, a you know, I don't want to, I don't want to say benevolent dictator because even dictator is a word that has a bad connotation, but you do, you are, you are a leader for a reason. Um, but you know, and I'm, you know, I think you probably know, especially lately, Matt, my, my faith has strengthened through the years and I'm a believer in servant leadership. I think servant leadership, my son, you know, my son, James coaches in the, in the, he's been in the NBA in the G league. And, and I remember this summer, he's helping me coach USA three on three. He's actually doing most of the coaching. And, and um, we, we have G league guys. We have good players, guys that have been in the NBA in, in a cu- couple cases. Jimmer Fredette's playing for us. Okay. Wow. And so we're in France and I get mad at a practice and I, I blow my top and later, and he's my assistant. Right. And later he goes over to me, he goes, dad, these guys are pros. You can't yell at them. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you can't yell at them, you know. <laughs> How did you take that? <laughs> well, I, I laughed to myself inside. Yeah. Because he has the self-awareness and like he's the kind of guy, and he did this last year to a player. You know, the, the three-on-three world tour run, we're trying to qualify for the Olympics. It's a great half-court sport, 12 mm. second shot clock. It's on YouTube. Yeah. A lot of my NBA friends are saying, send me that horn set that Serbia ran. You know, thing, there's a lot of creative three-on-three things going on, and we're studying it. I'm getting better, but uh, it's prize money. It's like being on the volleyball tour in Southern California. <clears throat> if you win, you make money. If you lose, you come home with no money. So – we were watching film last October and there's a missed block out. I won't tell you who it was, but the kid played at Duke. Okay. So he's been used to being yelled at <laughs> and, um, and it's a scrimmage. So it's only a scrimmage. And he says, uh, I won't even say the guy's name. I love the kid too. He's he'll be in the G league, maybe NBA this year. And he says to the player, Hey, see this missed block out right here. You just cost us 50 grand. And we got a 10 hour, we got a 10 hour flight back home. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like he put it in perspective. Like instead of yelling at him and going, "You got to block out here," yeah, it's like, dude, dude, you just you just cost us real, a- real consequences. Yeah, real yeah. consequence. And now we got to be on that ten-hour flight home and coach. So can't afford to put everybody in business class, and we're miserable because instead of you counting your money, splitting up fifty grand on a weekend, you just call. And again, that's so that's the modern coaching. And like I yeah. want some to. I watch young coaches. I watch a guy like Coach Drew, who rarely loses his cool. Yeah. But these guys get their point across. And what I would say, Matt, is coaching is evolving. They are changing. The kids are changing in many ways. They still want accountability. They still want they still want you to push them. It just becomes an art form and how you push them and get the most out of them. Mm. I'm a big believer in turning, you know, you know the try that, you know, we're at the top of the triangle as coaches, but when you flip it, that servant leadership right there, they become most important and you're down here. And I love hearing that about your faith. And that that's awesome. Uh, because at our school being a Christian school, we can, sure. we can talk about Christ and just unapologetically. And, and one of our kind of our core values is humility. And part yeah. of that humility is servant leadership. And we yep. just, we just talk all the time. And I've got one guy, one of my seniors names, Jack O'Neill, that, uh, I got Lee, like you can just feel, that his faith that one it's so real to him yeah. um it it just is infused in everything that he does but we are talking about just how Christ was the ultimate example of what servant leadership is yeah. talk about a coach of a team the 12 individuals that he had from very yeah. different backgrounds to start a yep. movement that has changed the world from yes. 12 people yeah, he's the ultimate coach, the ultimate well, servant the leader, ultimate, and a great example. He's the ultimate motivator because, like, when you look at what the disciples did, and then someone like Saint Paul, who, you know, we, I was just reading last night, they calculate that he he traveled ten thousand miles during his life on Earth once he was converted, right? Yep. And he, you talk about guys that are willing to, you know, we always joke, you know, we always say figuratively well these kids will die for that coach well these 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 early disciples literally did they literally were so convicted that christ was our messiah that he they you know like 
when I think, and I was just reading last night, you know, St. Paul at the very end, he's writing uh, what we think was a epistle to the Philippians and he's in jail in Rome and he knows the end is near, but he's got this incredible joy, you know, and gratitude to knowing that he's going to be home with Christ soon. And he could have been, he could have been miserable, you know, in a, in a, in a, and like, we think, we think from reading, uh, you know, acts that, he was converting Roman soldiers yeah. in prison. Like they were yeah. kind of like wondering, like, what's up with this guy? So getting back to, you know, again, that's 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 the ultimate leadership that that Jesus displayed, and it's almost like having a coaching tree, right? Yeah, no doubt. The <laughs> you know what I mean? That's the ultimate coaching tree. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's yeah. the ultimate coaching tree. So it's cool. And I would just say this to you: I used to say about my namesake i was named for saint francis of assisi right? i was great raised catholic there was a great phrase attributed to him we're not sure he actually said it preach everywhere preach everywhere if necessary use words and i tried to live my life that way like boy Fran is a good guy but it goes beyond that i've learned in recent years you know you can be a good guy and th- have people think you're a christian but you got to tell them too you have to tell them, like I'm, 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 I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and yeah, as I get up in my years now, and I was raised Catholic, and you're married at Highland Park Pres, and you know, um, but you have to, you not only have to walk the walk, you got to talk the talk, and I think it's important. Like I've really tried to get, you know, I've tried to figure out like why these early disciples were so convicted that they would, they, you know, literally Saint Paul was on the road to the, you know, to yeah. Damascus, and we we know the rest is history and so i there's a lot of parallels between coaching and being a christian you know no doubt being, being a good coach too and i love this direction that we went because one hey, I'm by all, the way I, let, let yeah. me just tell you david yeah. pollock has a great podcast david pollock i didn't know david we've communicated since espn let him go <clears throat> but david just had dabble sweeney on mm. It is an amazing coaching podcast because we know, you know, we know Dabo's a Christian, but it's really a great coaching podcast. He just, he just get on there uh, and listen, it's an hour and you will be David and his pastor friend can't think of his name. Now they asked two questions in an hour and all Dabo did was just explain coaching, his philosophy, his faith, two questions. It was nice. unbelievable. I wrote so that down. I will check it out. Yeah. You know, a big question, I think, for everybody is how do you know that the Bible is a reliable source? How do you know that uh, the disciples, what they believed is true and what we believe is true? And to me, there's two big things. Um, one is Paul's conversion to yeah. go from persecuting to being the ultimate apostle reading writing a third almost two-thirds of the new testament yeah you, you, that and then what you mentioned is the conviction of the disciples so like because people say well suicide bombers they believe in what they're doing too the yeah. difference is is that they're believing in something that and they're dying for something that they hope is true yeah the apostles wouldn't and disciples wouldn't have died for something that they knew was false yeah what i mean is like if they didn't see christ resurrected if paul didn't see him on the road to damascus and was blinded by it if that didn't happen then why would they endure all the things that they did because people will lie about stuff no doubt but they rarely die for a lie but yeah, what yeah, they'll yeah. do is they will die for the truth. Peter said, how can we not talk about the things that we've seen? And, and so I just believe that. And I talk yeah. to our guys a lot about that because we're bombarded daily with people trying to poke holes in the Bible, its reliability. And, and was Jesus just a good person? Did he even exist? Was he just his, all of this? But the, to me, the biggest thing is... 500 people saw Jesus resurrected, 500, not five dudes, not, not just Joe in his, in his basement and the conversion. So really fun to get to go that direction, coach. Well, you you know, I just say this because the two things that stick out to me is like, they didn't necessarily, the, 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 the disciples didn't necessarily believe Paul right away. 
because they knew, you know, they knew that he had been a person. They had a right to be skeptical of him right at the be beginning. And, and the other thing is, <clears throat> when Jesus was crucified, if it wasn't true, then somebody like Peter would have just gone about to being a fisherman. Yeah. And he would he would have just said, Okay, you know, that was fun while it lasted. And he he was a smart guy and he was, you know, he was a philosopher. And I, I you know, okay, he was a good guy, and but he didn't feel that way. And neither did the rest of the, you know, the disciples. And then like you said, the five hundred that saw him resurrected. Yeah. So I by the way, I I've been trying to figure out like last night I was reading about Paul because I wanted to know like like I've been to Saloniki, right? Thess Thessaloniki. It's up in the northern part of Greece. And it's, you know, the Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, right? And I've been to Rome and I've been to a few places that I've, I've, I've said, how did he get to all these places and, you know, being shipwrecked? And yeah. I learned last night that like these merchant ships would often take passengers. So if a merchant ship was going from like, let's say, and I don't know my Middle Eastern geography, but if they were going from, say, one part of the Middle East, uh, you know, uh, on the Israeli coast, to uh sicily or to the you know to 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 where rome you know where italy was i'm italian obviously (laughs) these people would get these people would jump on you know someone like paul would get on a merchant ship and sail to where he was going next and this guy went into turkey and you know all over the middle east and like i'm like the impact he had was amazing i'm fascinated by him because of what he what he endured as a as a converted christian thank you for checking out today's episode please take a moment to subscribe to this podcast share it with your fellow coaches and find us on social media for what's coming up next on the jamoti podcast it's just a matter of doing it